Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Facebook Live, YouTube, Instagram, good evening, conference call line. We thank God for the privilege of the 31st day of the fifth month of the 22nd year of the third decade of this century and third millennium. This is May 31st, and we thank God that we have come through the month of May. And we thank God that we remain faithful to the task as we endeavor to go deeper in God's word. Tonight, we will take our stand in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, the first chapter of Acts. As a matter of fact, the first 11 verses of the first chapter of the book of Acts. Let us pray. Gracious, ever-living, everlasting, ever-loving God, our Savior, we do thank you and we praise you for the privilege of this amazingly beautiful day. We thank you, God, for this foretaste of summer. And we pray that none has been too uncomfortable today. But we do remember sub-zero weather and we remember ice and snow. So we thank you for this day. And we ask you, God, to continue to give us days like this, our daily bread. We thank you for your word. It never fails us. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light into our pathway. We ask you, God, to send your word fully and freely as we study in Jesus' name. Thank you for all who are gathered in real time and for those who will glean from this lesson later on this week and even beyond that, as it is archived. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. Sunday was Ascension Sunday. It was the last Sunday in the seven-week season of Easter. Easter is a season of seven weeks, 49 days. And on the 50th day, we celebrate Pentecost. The number 50 is significant. It is a number of fulfillment. And we thank God for keeping God's promise. It coincides, of course, with the Feast of Pentecost when the faithful of the Jewish faith gathered in Jerusalem uh, to thank God for the first summer harvest. And we thank God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But just before we get to all of that, let's uh, look at the prelude, uh, what comes before. So let me begin the reading of our lesson tonight, Acts chapter one, beginning at verse one. And keep in mind, the book of Acts is actually volume two of the Gospel of Luke. That's why uh, verse one is so important. It is the bridge. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It goes something like this. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, 
It is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as I indicated, the book of Acts is volume two of the Gospel of Luke. In theological circles, it's known as Luke slash Acts. And it is a wonderful flow. So once you get through the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, you go right into the period of preparation before the birth of the church as we have come to know it in our dispensation. So this was a bittersweet occasion. Uh, the people had gotten used to Jesus. They had been with him and uh, Jesus was vindicated. Uh, he took the sting from death and robbed the grave of its victory. So it was natural for the people to want Jesus to stay in their midst, uh, this superhuman uh, being <laughs> uh, who had done everything, including defeating death. And it was natural for them to want him now to establish the kingdom of God on earth using Jerusalem as the headquarters. And it was natural for them to want every other nation to pay homage to them, knowing their history, knowing their period of enslavement, knowing their persecution, knowing that the Roman Empire had annexed Palestine and made them a vassal state, they were looking for sweet revenge. And they thought that through the agency of Jesus, they would get it. Jesus was the incarnation as many suspected uh, of Elijah. And it was the messianic expectation that Elijah would come back to earth and would take his seat on Mount Zion. And once there, Israel would be established forever and that there would be heaven on earth. And that's what these footstep followers were anticipating. Even though Jesus had told them other things, this was their anticipation and their expectation. So when Jesus tells them that he's got to leave, they are in a panic because they don't know what to do. Jesus has become their shield and buckler. He was their sure defense. He was their strong tower. He was everything. And they could not imagine life without him. I would imagine that some assumed that once he left, everybody who was an ancestral enemy <laughs> would come, gather them up, and exterminate them. They just didn't know if they would have the energy and the wherewithal to withstand all of that. They didn't know if they would have the faith to even employ the teachings of Jesus. 
However, Jesus wanted to assure them that they would have more than enough, that they already had more than enough. But there was one other thing that he was going to impart in them. He was going to activate in them. And that was and is the very spirit of God that we call the Holy Spirit. Some call the Holy Ghost. And uh, Jesus knew what they could do. He, he told them in other passages. He told them in the 14th chapter of John that greater works than these he had done, they would do because he would go back uh, to the Father. But uh, they just weren't hearing any of that. They, uh, they were frightened. And not unlike us, we have inhaled and absorbed the teachings, many of us, from childhood. But when it comes time to practice, to put into effect what we have been taught, we doubt our ability to either remember, to follow up, or to follow through. We just don't think that we're up to the task. And Jesus says, yes, yes, we are. Yes, we can. <laughs> we can make it. We can handle it. And, and this teaching is so important, not so that we become less dependent on Jesus and more dependent on ourselves, but that we realize and recognize and honor and value the confidence that God has placed in us to do miraculous and wonderful and amazing things in this life. And for those of us who dare trust Jesus and dare step out on our faith, dare put ourselves in the water and dare walk on the water, God is with us. And it doesn't mean that we're supposed to become full of ourselves and full of our sufficiency because we know that on our own, we can't do it. But with God, we can do all things. So we're ever mindful, even after we have success and victory, that it is the very living spirit of God in us that is allowing us to inch, achieve the incredible, see the invisible, and believe the impossible. You remember Sunday I used an illustration of uh, bike riding. Uh, very few of us just started out on a two-wheel bike. Uh, our parents uh, would not be that risk, risky. <laughs> with us because the overwhelming majority of our parents loved us and did not want to see us face disaster. So we, we started with tricycles, some of us, or some of us went straightway to a two-wheel bike with training wheels. And... Uh, for a while, that was more than enough. I mean, we were in motion. We were riding up and down the sidewalks. We were enjoying ourselves. But we even noticed that there was another level of achievement that we had to experience. Because we saw the older children riding past us on two wheels, enjoying the wind in their faces. And some of them were so confident uh, that they would raise the handlebars and, and ride on one wheel. And there wasn't a, a one of us who did not want to do likewise but we were afraid and our parents knew it 
And uh, the older children knew it because they had already gone through it. <laughs> uh, everybody wants to shield and protect their child from falling and scraping uh, their legs and, and, and running the risk of breaking bones. But some of that happens as we go from one degree of achievement to the next. We have to learn that in life, all of us will fall a time or two. We'll all fall down. And God is there to pick us up. Uh, God doesn't have a problem with us falling uh, because God is there. God has a problem when we fall down and we stay down. I'll never forget the, uh, the story that... Uh, Dr. Kevin Terman uh, once told during uh, one of his great sermons of uh, a little boy uh, who was sent to church one Sunday. His mother uh, was not feeling well and uh, he put on his Sunday best and uh, his mother uh, warned him uh, not to play in the puddles. It had rained the night before and the ground was still wet. And uh, sure enough, uh, he managed to get to church uh, without uh, ruining his clothes. But on his way home, uh, he couldn't resist uh, jumping in the puddles. And uh, so the first couple of puddles that he jumped in uh, were okay. The water splashed and very little got on him and he felt smug and secure. But the last puddle that he jumped in he had mud at the bottom and he lost his footing and he fell in that muddy puddle and his clothes were soiled. And he was very near the house so near that his mother could see him out of the window. And the little boy, knowing his punishment, sat in the muddy puddle and just cried and sobbed and cried as if he would engender sympathy from his mother who by that time had uh, closed the curtain and come out on the porch and come toward him. And she had what we call a switch. Some of us are old enough to know that. My grandmother grew a peach tree that never really matured <laughs> because when she was ready to apply punishment to our backsides, she'd make us go out in the garden and choose our own switch, uh, a, a, a small branch off of the tree. <laughs> and uh, she would strip the leaves and then she'd go to work on our backsides and on the back of our legs. <laughs> I, I know that none of that ever happened to anybody uh, who is listening tonight. <laughs> but it certainly happened to me. And uh, so the mother, uh, who had already told the boy not to play in the puddles, came and she started whipping him. And the little boy was astounded. He said, Mother, why are you hitting me? You see that I have fallen. Don't you care? And she said, I'm not whipping you because you fell. Yes, you were disobedient. But I'm whipping you because you haven't gotten up. <laughs> yeah, Donnie McClurkin uh, made a song very popular a few years ago. We fall down, but we get up. 
A saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. So, so that's one of the things that you and I have to understand about this journey of life. We will fall, but we don't have to stay in a fallen position. So we have to understand uh, that is a part of the process and it should not prevent us from having the courage to learn how to ride a two-wheel bicycle. And, and this illustration, uh, at least for me, is a beautiful one. And, and it, is, it is deep in, in its perspective. Because even now, when you think about everything that faces us, you think about all the, the perplexities uh, that that face us in life. You think about all of the violence. You think about all of the war. You think about all of the craziness. Uh, we appeal to God. We want God to step in and intervene and fix things for us. But while we're waiting on God, God is waiting on us because God has already given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We just haven't tapped into it. We, uh, we haven't availed ourselves of the power. And, and some of us have done it individually, but we haven't learned how to do it collectively and communally. There isn't anything that we're facing that with the power of God, we can't overtake, overcome and overthrow. You and I have got to believe that. There is a solution for every problem. And God has given us the power. I wish somebody would hear me tonight. God has given us the power to do something about our situations. If we're willing. God is more than able. So this passage of scripture really talks about that. It talks about the fact that uh, the people don't know how they're going to make it without Jesus. And Jesus has been telling them, oh, yeah, you're going to do swell without me because you're not going to have me physically, but you're going to have me spiritually. You're going to have my power. You're going to have my uh, dunamis, my dynamite. You're going to have my unction. You're going to have my authority. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. So whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that's one of the challenges uh, of, of uh, our unfinished business. We, we just, we, we just haven't gotten there yet. Have we? I mean, we're too busy majoring in the minors. We're too busy uh, comparing uh, ourselves to each other. We're, we, we, <laughs> you know, we live in the valley of low expectations. Uh, we don't think that God is able. And God is more than able. And God has enabled us. I wish somebody would hear me tonight. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the purpose of this new season that we're going to embrace called Pentecost. That's where God wants us to be. We ought to walk in great power because of the God in us. We ought not be helpless. We, we, we ought not be victims. Uh, we, we have the victory in Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes, we do. And, and there isn't anything that we can't have. There isn't anything that, that we can't achieve. There, there isn't anything that we can't handle because we've got the power. The enemy doesn't want us. The enemy wants us to be helpless, hapless, and hopeless. And it is a lie. We've got the power. 
Those folks in Washington, D.C., they have the power. They have the power to enact gun legislation. They have the power to take the weapons of war and destruction off of our streets. They have the power to, to stop illegal gun sales. They have the power to minister to people who are suffering with mental illness and all kinds of of trauma and tragedy. They've got the will. They've got the power. They've got the wallet. They just don't have the will. They just don't have the will. They'd, they'd rather bow at the altar of the National Rifle Association. Like, like the NRA has a heaven or a hell to put them in. It, when you think about it, it's the most insane thing. But I want to let you know that sin and evil are insane. <laughs> They're just insane. <laughs> They're insane. And they're stupid. I know we think that, that evil is cunning, but, but evil is no match for God. God can take evil and turn it around. Do you know that E-V-I-L turned around spells L-I-V-E? <laughs> Anybody ever check out, <laughs> check that out? Yeah, just, just turn it. Listen, thank you, Holy Ghost. God can turn evil into life. We serve a God who can turn things around. And God has given us that power. I just don't think that we believe it. I, I, I just think that, that we don't understand it. Uh, we are walking powder kegs. And, and the reason why I know it is, is because we spend most of our time cursing ourselves instead of blessing ourselves. We spend more time talking about, I can't have it. I can't do it. I can't feel it. I'm not going to get any better. Things are not going to work out. We don't spend enough time saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't spend enough time saying many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them from them all. We don't spend enough time saying eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not even entered into the consciousness those good things that God has in store for those who love God. We don't spend enough time saying all things work together for the good for them that love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. I'm telling you, we we we've got to take we got to take this negative spirit out of. Listen, that's why the Holy Spirit has come to expel and evict the negative spirit in us, to take all of our can'ts, our c n c a n apostrophe t's away. And exchange them for C-A-N, cans. <laughs> yes, God. Yes, God. I mean, that's where we have to be because we've got it. It's in us. Les Brown was telling the story, you know, great motivational coach, life coach. Les, Les Brown was telling the story. He was talking to a man. And, and every time he attempted to encourage the man, the man said, yeah, but, and then he gave the opposite to the affirmation. And, and Les Brown went on a little bit further and the man said, yeah, but, <laughs> and after a couple of minutes of that, uh, Les Brown said, you know what? You're going to have to move your butts out of the way <laughs> if you're going to have victory in life. Yeah, I, I think I just said something. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Frederick Sampson. Yeah, you and I have got to move our butts out of the way. They, they, don't, they don't do us any good. They're, they're, they're baggage. <laughs> they're, they're a heavy, debilitating load. 
So as we enter the season of the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and it's, it's the longest season of the church year, uh, it'll be anywhere from uh, 24 uh, to 28 weeks. I haven't calculated uh, this particular cycle, but uh, it's going to get us all the way through the summer and the fall. And we're going to explore the possibilities of, of, of achievement and overcoming and victory over everything because of the Spirit of God. If you're willing to go on this journey with me, uh, just say amen. <laughs> you, you're not too young and you're not too old. But there is no good thing that God will withhold from those who love God. You, you and I have got to be convinced of that. We, we've, got to be, we, we've got to be sold on that. How do you think you've made it this far? <laughs> how, do, how, do, how, do you think, how do you think you've overcome the little bit that you have overcome? How do you think that you learned how to ride a bike? At some point, you had to trust and believe that you would steady yourself on that frame. You'd keep those wheels on the ground. Um, yes, I, I thank God for uh, my ability, although I haven't ridden in quite a while, my ability to ride a bike. But I, I also approach skateboarding. And uh, when I was growing up, there weren't a whole bunch of, uh, of guys or gals who looked like me who picked up a skateboard. And uh, if you think that riding a bike is something, riding a skateboard is something too. It's definitely about balance. It's definitely about controlling speed. And of course, with a bike, you know, you have built-in brakes. But uh, when you skateboard, you have to use your feet uh, as, as both your accelerator and your brakes. <laughs> And when I asked for a skateboard, my people thought that I had lost my mind. <laughs> they said, we don't see anybody that looks like us who skateboards. I said, well, I'm going to skateboard. You're going to fall and you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to fall and somebody says, you're going to fall and break your neck. I said, no, I'm not. And I know I should have worn a helmet. You know, we weren't that. Uh, you know, when you grow up in the 60s and 70s, you probably didn't uh, adhere to a lot of safety precautions. <laughs> I hope I have some help on this line. You know, I mean, we just uh, recently found out that, that, that drinking water out of a water hose uh, can poison us. <laughs> we grew up drinking water on a hot day out of a water hose, didn't we? And when we dropped food on the ground, we didn't let it stay in, on the ground five seconds. We, you know, depending on what it was, we'd pick it up, kiss it up to God and put it in our mouths, didn't we? I'm going to leave all that alone because I know that's just too old timey for somebody. But uh, a lot of things that should have killed us didn't. And learning how to ride a skateboard did not kill me. As a matter of fact, it was exhilarating. Uh, it was wonderful. It was amazing. But my riding a skateboard was rooted and grounded in my faith. I wish somebody would hear me. Yes, it was enjoyable. Yes, I, I got a thrill. Yes, I could pop a wheelie. I did all of those things, but I believed because I believed that God gave me the power to do whatever it was that I put my mind to. <laughs> Somebody needs to help me tonight. Too many of us have lost our dreams. Too many of us have lost our way. Too many of us have given up. We're just hanging on and holding on and waiting for the undertaker. <laughs> but I come against that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the risen Savior. 
You and I have power. We have power to walk right. We have power to talk right. We have power to live right. We have power to love right. We have power to give right. We've got power. We just need to plug into it. I stumbled across a West African proverb one day and uh, it was so good to me. Uh, I have it framed. I have this little saying framed and it is in my uh, in the pastor study, in my study uh, right above uh, my computer, my my desktop. And 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 the frame, the 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 em the embroidered inside of the frame uh, is comprised of feet. And, and the quote says, every prayer must have feet. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah, you know, if you're praying about something, uh, you've got to be willing to put some skin in the game. You've got to be willing to become an answer to the prayer. You know, we used to laugh, and, and I know it's not in the Bible, but uh, our, our, the older folks that we grew up with, they would tell us all the time that if you make one step, God will make two. Didn't they say that? Do you remember that? If you make one step, he'll make two? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we used to march in on a song. It was entitled One Step. All I have to do is make one step and he'll do the rest. So we just need uh, to be reacquainted with this. Uh, there, there, there are some people who, who need this. They, they, they need it. They, they need it more than some of the rest of us because some of us have been practicing this. We, we have been practicing uh, our faith. We, we have been, we have tapped into the spirit realm. We believe God. We just don't believe in God. We believe God. We believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek God. And we just don't let anything and we don't let anybody talk us out of our spiritual inheritance. So uh, in summary, uh, these folks were asking Jesus before he left. He says, now they said, now, is this the time that uh, the kingdom of heaven will be established on earth? Is this the time that everybody will kneel and bow to us? Jesus said that day and those times uh, are not your privy. But I can tell you this, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. That's what an apostle is. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and in the utmost parts of the world. Yes, you will. I'll give you the power to turn around an upside down world right side up. I know we haven't tapped into that power yet. We haven't tapped into the power to study war no more. We, we haven't tapped into the power of beating our swords into uh, plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. But we've got the power. We've got to believe it. And we've got to activate it. So finally, the angels, uh, these... these uh, Two visitors uh, clothed in white while Jesus was taking his flight. Uh, the people were looking in the in the sky and they said, why are you looking up toward heaven? <laughs> you, you got work to do. The man has already told you what to do. He spent 40 days with you. Now he wants you to spend the next 10 days getting yourselves together, getting on one accord, working out your differences, working out your pettiness, working out your jealousy. Want you to tarry in Jerusalem for 10 days. And if you get on the same page, then God will come through like a mighty rushing wind. My God in Zion. 
that promise is still available to us. All we have to do is stop turning on each other and turn to each other. Start recognizing the good and the God in us. And I'm talking specifically to believers right now. Because if we would get out of our own ways and get in God's will and get in God's flow, you would see a dramatic difference in the way life would be lived. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We're supposed to make the difference. But again, we've allowed the enemy to confound us and confuse us. And I come against that spirit now in the name of Jesus. Let's get on the same page. Let's get on one accord. Let us believe that God is no shorter than God's word. Let us believe that we are an emancipated people, an empowered people, a people of purpose, a people of destiny, a people who are recession and depression proof, a people who will reap a harvest even in dry ground. I pray somebody will believe that. If you haven't, I pray that you will begin to believe that. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you and we praise you for this time together. Thank you. If there were no technical difficulties, no interruptions tonight. We thank you, God, for allowing your word to flow fully and freely. And as amazing and as remarkable as this teaching is, it is available. We can do this. You've given us the power. And we thank you. We'd have an issue if we were powerless. But you give power to the faint and you restore youth as an eagle's. Yes, you do. That's why Isaiah declared that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We praise you for healing. We praise you for deliverance. We praise you for breakthrough. We praise you, God, for comfort. We praise you, God, that you are the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in you, though they die, they shall live again. You've got everything covered. Thank you for the power. Now bless us, God, as we proceed through the evening. Send your angel armies to guard and guide us and secure us until morning's light. And then lift us to praise you, not just with our lips, but with our very lives. You are worthy. Thank you for your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of song, and then I'm going to bid you adieu. Amen, amen, amen. Let me get to the song, and I pray that it will be a blessing to you. It's short and sweet, but it works every time. Sister Nisi sings, there is power in the blood 
of the Lamb. The precious blood of the Lamb is their power. In the blood. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Anybody believe that? In the blood. Wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. And don't be fooled. That power is in you and it is in me. And we thank God. Th Thursday night, if you'd like, join the Fellowship Hour on the conference call line. Friday night on the conference call, the conference call line, we will be tuned and together for prayer. 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time for both of those encounters. And then Sunday is Pentecost Day. It is the day when God has, uh, it has been recorded that God has unleashed the power of heaven on earth. And you and I ought to definitely want to celebrate this great power. Wear red Sunday if you're coming to worship. Uh, that is the color of fire and the Holy Ghost. And, and I know that God will do something for us, to us, and with us. Uh, you can wear a hint of red, a red scarf, a red tie. Uh, show up and let's celebrate Jesus. And for those of you who don't show up, get up. You can still wear red, <laughs> even in the comfort of your home. Uh, let's be on one accord. God loves that kind of unity. God can do something when people uh, make themselves available, not just individually, but collectively. 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, in person, on Facebook Live, the conference call line, YouTube, and Instagram. Love you. Be blessed. 
Have a victorious night and even a better tomorrow.